The explosive arrival of Islam into history was, it is safe to say, a profound shock to the Christian religion and civilization. No sooner had Christianity established itself throughout the Roman Empire and beyond than Islam arrived and in an obscenely short period of time had arrested the Middle East and North Africa from Christian rulers, shutting off trade routes and crippling Europe for centuries. Christian polemic against Islam from early encounters onwards has tended to be bitter. The Muslims were typically portrayed as heretics or else heathens, pagans, misled by Muhammad who was portrayed as either mad, bad or both. We don't need to rehearse this sort of polemic. There is a tradition of it extending over a thousand years. And beyond Christianity, it extends deeply into secular attitudes too. The historical fact is that Islam and the Islamic world has been a rival civilization, a hostile neighbor. The historical narrative described this world as barbaric, cruel, artificial, an imposture, a bed of heresy. It is remarkable then that from the, eight, from the early 1800s onwards, there was a movement in European ideas intent on learning about this world through sympathetic eyes. Any proper knowledge of the Islamic world thwarted through the centuries by prejudice, fear and hostility. But there was a movement, a shift, towards genuine curiosity across a broad range of intellectuals, artists and writers, collectively referred to these days as the Orientalists. From the early 1800s onwards, or earlier, European intellectuals began an open study of the East, the Muslim Orient. The curiosity extended to the Far East too, Japan and China, but the main focus of the Orientalist was what we now call the Islamic world, what Muslims traditionally called Taras Islam, the house of peace, such as it was. The shift can be explained in terms of geopolitical changes, certainly. The context was European colonialism. This created conditions of safe passage and over the next century, hundreds of the brightest and most inquiring minds and best artists of Europe, Russia too, travelled to the Muslim Orient to explore, appreciate and understand. In some cases, this overlapped with the business of colonialism. Many Orientalists first travelled to the East employed by colonial administrations, but they invariably found the lure of the East compelling. Many chose to travel again independently or else stayed. For the most part, their work was independent of nefarious colonial agendas, which is to say, very little of it is propaganda. It is a facile and immature Marxism that dismisses this significant movement of ideas as an evil instrument of empire. On that issue, in fact, the opposite is true. The sympathetic depiction of the colonial other, as the sociologist would have it, helped to create public disquiet with colonialist excesses and at length sympathy for nationalist aspirations in the subject peoples. No doubt the Orientalists indulged certain stereotypes about the Orient, but they also undermined centuries of deeper and more destructive stereotypes. They removed simplistic medieval caricatures. The artists portrayed ordinary people at their lives, village scenes, street scenes, mothers, children, craftsmen. The travel writers wrote about the same. This is really the first time that Europeans had any general and full sense of ordinary life in that world. The paintings were the first real view into that world. There are earlier depictions of the Islamic world in European art, but not many. We can trace Orientalism, broadly defined, back to the Venetian painters of the Renaissance, although their subject matter was the Oriental visitor, the Muslim diplomat in Christendom. The Orientalist painters give the first full view inside the Muslim world. French artists travel to Algeria and French North Africa. They paint what they see. The trend becomes pronounced when Egypt is taken by Napoleon. A steady stream of considerable French artists travel to Egypt. They record it through European eyes, assuredly, in a European medium, but their work reports a discovery. Previously in the European mind, Egypt was a place in the Bible. The Orientalists discovered both Egyptian antiquity and the modern Egyptians, as William Lane was to, was to call the contemporary Muslims there. These, in fact, were twin themes in Orientalist art, and among writers too. 
not only the Orient but antiquity as well. This is an important but little noted thing about this intellectual movement. In the paintings, scenes from, an, from antiquity, either myth or history, and scenes from Muslim, Muslim life are often hard to distinguish. The journey to the Orient was also a reconnection with antiquity. The journey east was at the same time a journey into the past. To this extent, it had depth. The reach into the past was philosophical and imaginative. The Orientalists chose to paint the Islamic world with a classical dignity. An Orientalist painting of Cleopatra's court might look very similar to a painting of a Muslim harem. A painter might use the same fabrics or furnishings in both, almost interchangeably. And the Jews were part of the Orient too. The Orient, indeed, was as much an idea as a place. Yet the Orientalists engaged deeply with the world they encountered. They were often excellent draftsmen who added fiercely objective renderings of architectural features or tile patterns or calligraphy or Muslim decorations into their works. There are individual styles, but Orientalism is distinguished by a combination of careful, objective, almost scientific observation with an idealization from the academic norms going back probably to Bellini and the Venetians. Or perhaps we should just say a marriage of observation and imagination, because indeed this is not just arid observation but art, observation transformed through the lens of the artist. This is what we see in Orientalism, the Orient through Occidental eyes. It is an Occidental art after all, and it can't apologise for that. It is especially interesting in this regard. No doubt this artistic world is a world of fantasy, but it is a worthy fantasy. Antiquity and the Orient are both mythic places in this vision. We should remember this when we encounter the, the erotic in this context. Its roots are actually Solomonic, and here it stands against the long, lurid Christian tradition of scandal attached to Mohammedan sexual mores. These paintings do not cater to scandal. The sensuality of these images is presented as noble. It is we who now view them with a mean Puritanism. We ourselves live in a new bout of these same old narratives. Notice how anti-Muslim narratives today find scandal in the Prophet's marriage to Aisha. And post-colonial moralism finds these depictions repugnant. Post-colonial responses are sordidly political. These paintings are now almost exclusively considered through the pervasive political morality of our times. In their historical setting, it was a great virtue that they cast the East as a place of, er of erotic adventure. This was the secret that the Orientalists discovered, exposed and explored. Against centuries of demonization, the Orient was in fact desirable. The Orientalists made the Orient a safe arena for the European erotic imagination. This throughout the Victorian era. Assuredly, this art does sometimes engage with old themes of danger, savagery, lust, violence, but now in a different frame, with a different tone, and without the same blind menace. If anything, there is an admiration for oriental horsemanship and weaponry, and a brave dignity is more common than depictions or even suggestions of barbarism. It is very hard to avoid the conclusion that these artists admired and respected, sometimes maybe even envied, the people they moved among and captured on canvas. It is churlish to sneer at whatever assumptions they carried with them. And as it stands, the Orientalists provide a record of the twilight era of classical Islamic civilization, and for this alone we should be grateful. The world observed and yes, romanticized if you insist, by the Orientalists no longer exists. It ended, historically speaking, with the breakup of the Ottoman Empire, the world wars, the era of nation-states, the new Puritanism of Wahhabi Islam. So this body of work is of immense value as a rendering of that late period. In some cases, they have given us images that are iconic of that period. Realists will complain that it's not real enough. Actually, there is an abundance of finished works and sketches that are absolutely faithful to their subject matter by any objective standard. It is a very rich historical record. More broadly, 
these works provide us with a detailed view of Islamic life, architecture, clothing, manners, habits in that time before the breach of modernity. We see views of traditional life, the traditional crafts, the pre-industrial orient. It was an interchange too. I only speak of European orientalists, but in fact artists from many colonial, colonial countries embraced this same style, the same project. There were many notable Ottoman painters who adopted the orientalist styles and subject matter, for example. So perhaps it is entirely wrong to cast it so emphatically as a European phenomenon. The whole project was the rendering of life and lands of the East in a worthy art. That's all. That's the whole objective of Orientalism generally. The rendering of the life and lands of the East in a worthy art. Artists of the East participated. In its totality, Orientalism was a very broad movement that included not only artists and travel writers, but novelists, poets, as well as scientists, botanists, cartographers, folklorists, historians, archaeologists. It was a great intellectual undertaking, now maligned in its aftermath. In aesthetic terms, we are probably in a better position to appreciate this work now. It was lost under the deluge of modernism in the early 20th century. There were artists we might count as Orientalists working up until the 1920s, but by then they had been thoroughly eclipsed and belonged to a former age. But modernism has exhausted itself today, and we can look back on the 19th century with a fresh objectivity. In fact, more than a few Orientalist artists contributed to the rise of modernism, but modernism defined itself against the academic styles typical of the Orientalist movement. There was a time say in the 1970s, when Orientalist art was regarded as both politically and aesthetically odious. Even today, baby boomers scour the archives of art museums in their quest to decolonialize their collections. Meanwhile, the biggest market for Orient Orientalist art is in the Arab world. It's not as if this art has ever been regarded as offensive by the peoples it depicts. It has only ever been regarded as offensive by a single generation of Western intellectuals. There is a powerful case for rehabilitating it from such people. We don't need to make a case though that this art is agreeable and often beautiful and sometimes sublime. It speaks for itself. This is a significant movement of accomplished artists from across the full range of European national backgrounds, including countries that had no interest in colonialism and from colonized artistic communities besides. Their enterprise was cross-cultural, stepping beyond the civilizational boundaries and patterns that had been in place since at least the early Crusades. They were very obviously entranced by the beauty of the Orient, its landscape, its colours, its light, its surfaces, its people, and they set out to depict it as well and therefore as true as they could. <laughs>